Okay, well, I know in uh, a presentation about a year ago, Larry had talked about Eisner buttons extensively. And <clears throat> when he asked me to do this presentation, he uh, wanted me to add any buttons back in that were missing or updated information that I may have had. And as I started doing that, I, I realized that that was quite a, a large task. So as opposed to talking about different types of scouting buttons, once again, I'm going to reflect on the Eisner buttons alone. And those range from 1910 until 1932. And essentially, uh, of those, there are three main types. There are the ones that have the BS of A and the English fleur de -lis. They're the ones that have the first class sign and BS of A. And then there's the one that has the first class sign with patent 1911. So I know it's very faint on the center button. Um, this is the only example I have. You can barely make out OF and also A uh, right above the smile of the second class symbol. So the B and the S are not on the button at all. It doesn't look like they wore off. It looks like they just were not struck very well in the manufacturing process. That'll be a, a common theme as you look at buttons that either there are manufacturing errors or there are a lot of wear issues that make it hard to determine exactly what you're looking at. Um, so moving forward, this is the uh, BSA button and some of the back variations that they have. So the, the top two images are the large back variations that I have. So there's this kind of reinforced ring that's pressed in on the one pictured in the middle. And then the top right one is one where if you, if you look at the red bank, the N is very close to the K and there's no period after the J. And then there's a large space in between the R and the Eisner and the J in the New Jersey. And that becomes uh, interesting as we look at variations moving forward. So the bottom row are some of the smaller shirt buttons or the buttons that would have been on the pockets of the tunics. And so you see a couple of different raised or pressed rings on the first two of different sizes and then an S. Eisner and Co. and uh, NJ as well. And then the next one, the N, sorry, on that one, the NJ, there are, there are no periods in between the New Jersey, the N and the J of New Jersey. Um, it didn't look like wear on that one, just something that was not included originally. The next button clearly shows those, those pressed periods after the N and the J. And then the final button kind of lines up with the one above as well, where there's the large gap and the K and the N are super close together. Um, so moving on to our next, this is the BS of A button. As I discussed earlier, you, you're, there's no B or S on this particular example. And this being the only example I have, um, this is the, the one backing that I have that has the same um, impressions that those earlier buttons did. So where there's the N and the K are super close together and the, and the large space between the J and the R. If anybody on the call or anybody out there, out there has others of these BS of A buttons with different backs, I sure would love to hear about that. So now we move on to the first class button with patent 1911. And there are a few different varieties of those. There may be more that are not pictured here, but these are some that I could put my hands on. Um, in the first example, you see the eagle's wings swoop up. And in the middle example, you can see it has a very squatty wide crown. And in the last example, you can see the wings of the eagle are very flat along the top. So those are all three very easy to identify fronts. Um, I have begun the work to try to match up which fronts and which backs go together. But as you might imagine, that is a very tedious process that I was not able to complete for this video. 
<clears throat> so here are some of the backs of the small shirt buttons. On the top, um, you see that there's the red bank that has a dash in between it. And then we have one that shows a uh, red bank with the periods after the N and the J. And then the next one, which is probably one of the most common that you'll see is an Eisner Co with a couple of stars impressed in. So you'll see that one on the top right and the bottom right. The bottom right has an additional um, impressed line. And I see that on quite a number of them. So I don't know if that was something that happened uh, specifically in the manufacturing process or a change of dye or what, but they're, they're definitely distinct with that additional ring going around in the center. The bottom one on the on the left, the patent night, uh, sorry, patent 722-1913 through 226-1918. And then the next one um, is very similar to the one above it. However, the there is no period after the J. It's uh it's definitely not worn out or worn off and uh is very, very clear. This next set are some that don't have markings, but definitely seem to be from this same time period. And we have the top one, which is uh, kind of a domed or pressed out shape. And then in the center, there's a small raised area. It's probably eight millimeters or so that's, that's raised in the center. And then the one on the right um, has kind of that press design that we saw where it's uh, maybe 10 millimeters in, 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 <clears throat> and indented. That's all, uh, from what I could gather, a technique to reinforce the ring and, and make it stronger. So moving on, these are some really large buttons. Um, I've only found them in two varieties from this time period in metal. The one in the center is the S. Eisner, S. Eisner Co. with the uh, dotted rings inside and outside of the lettering. And then the one on the right, the picture is a little hard to see, but it actually has a reinforcing ring that's, that's very square edged and pressed in um, both right around the shank and then slightly uh, inside the outer edge of the button. The other bottom button there is on the left is a plastic button. Um, that type of plastic we call vegetable ivory, and we can talk about those a little bit later in the presentation. I don't know exactly when that particular one began, but they were definitely uh, available in the 20s, if not earlier. So speaking of vegetable ivory, here's a couple of variations on that. So the this one... Um, you can see kind of has a squatty crown, like one of those other versions that we saw. And it distinctly has the patent 1911 date on it. Then on the next button, you see that the patent 1911 is, is definitely not there. It's not worn off, it's not a dye issue, it's just not available in that version. And the version that doesn't have the patent 1911 on it has this pressed in ferrule, um, and the ferrule is flexible, like um, it's hinged, I guess is a better word. So it moves back and forth and would lay more flat on your, on your coat. And that's opposed to the next variety that, uh, well, not this particular picture. These are two more of those hinged varieties. These are a smaller button and it's really faint and hard to tell. But on the first one, there is a star in between the New Jersey and the Eisner. And then in between the Eisner, the S and the of the Eisner and, and red, there's a small arrow that points toward the shank. And then in the second variety of that, also a hinged pressed in ferrule, there's the S Eisner, um, but it does not have the star. And oddly enough, its arrow is, comes right out of the top of the N on the New Jersey. It's very faint and hard to tell, but uh, but it's definitely there. So I'm not sure why why those would be different, but there they are. 
So then you have the ones that have the fixed ferrule, so it's not hinged. And the one on the left is the large version with uh, periods in between the N and J. And the one on the right, there are no periods in between the N and J, and it's the smaller uh, sleeve or pocket button. So <clears throat> in the vegetable ivory, there's a couple of different ways they're attached. So we saw the ones with the different ferrules that had been pressed in. This is where they have a molded attachment to, to be sewn through. And with vegetable ivory, I don't know if you can notice on the bottom left picture, but you see where that hole is drilled through. It's a, it's a very light color. When they're first pressed, they're all that very light color, that light color line you're seeing. And then they're dyed. And that dye um, is absorbed into the surface. And so you can see in those first or the top picture and the bottom picture, all the variations of colors that you can get. And I believe that's originally from not only manufacturing, but I also believe it's attributable to how they're stored and uh, washed or any chemicals they may come in contact with. But I also think it's it, it was a, a variable between the different shades as they came out of the dye lots. So here you see a couple of different uh, front faces on, on these buttons. Um, and you can note the variations in the peaks of the, uh, of the eagles, sorry, of the uh, Florida Lees behind the eagles. So even though these aren't marked Eisner, um, I believe these were manufactured for and are by and used during the Eisner period. So here, here's something that may be hard to tell. I don't know if you can see in this button, but there's some, some fine cracking that goes from the edging into the middle. And these vegetable ivory buttons, if they're either stored in a airtight container, the chemicals from within that they're made of will make them break down like this. And are they're stored in excessive heat or if they've had certain chemicals, uh, if they've come into contact with certain chemicals, they'll be, begin to break down. And if they were left sealed up in a, in a bag uh, for a long period of time, essentially they would just break down into a dusty sort of powdery form. So if you have any of these buttons, please be sure to make sure they're not sealed up or uh, you may come back and find out they've, they've deteriorated beyond repair. So that's pretty much what I wanted to wrap up with today. I did not cover the backs of the large buttons because as I was doing this process, I realized how vast it was. And uh, so there are definitely some variations in those that were not shown in Larry's presentation and were not shown in the presentations of the small buttons. Um, so if you guys would have me back, I would love to come and, and talk about those in the future as well as cover some of the other program areas that Eisner manufactured in both the Cubs and the Sea Scouts. Um, and then if y'all like those and would like more, I would like to uh, do some presentations on some of the other manufacturers because there's quite a few others and quite a number of, of varieties. I think I take away from this experience that I wish somebody um, had a book to, <laughs> that covered all these and um, uh, and that might be where I'm, I'm heading with this project if somebody doesn't pipe up and say they have it and they've done all this work already. So thank you so much. And I'll take any questions you may have. Because it was my understanding back in the day that you had the, the washing tub and then above the tub was a ringer. And Correct. That whenever you had to do scout stuff or any kind of stuff back then, all the buttons had to come off before you washed it. I don't know. That's that definitely that, that's definitely why you see those damaged buttons so much when they're when they're out in the wild. Well, I, and Randall had a good question on what the definition of vegetable ivory. And of course, I would question, too, about when bacolite started to be used. Right. And so I tried to delve into that a, a little bit in my research and to to simplify things, I call it vegetable ivory because we can see when those holes are drilled in the back that there's that white undercoating. Um, and, and I don't know that you get that on the on the Bakelite. And it's, it's my understanding really the only way to tell uh, sort of some high-tech equipment 
is to take a hot needle and poke into the back of them and sniff the fumes. And that's just not something I'm willing to do either health wise or to damage the button to find out specifically what the material is. But I think, I think for our concerns that we can kind of consider the, you know, the bake light or the bake light or the vegetable ivory, um, the early buttons, and then we can talk in the future about the more modern plastics that are on our uniforms today and, you know, that we wore in the 70s and probably some of you guys 60s or 50s um, as well. But I think that pretty much transitioned. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it transitioned probably in the in the 50s from those earlier type materials into the more modern plastics that we have now. Um, one other thing, some of those buttons with the pressed ferrules, those would have been on more of like your your dress sort of uniforms so they wouldn't have they would have been different fabrics and they wouldn't have necessarily been going through the ringer washer anyways do you remember how you got into collecting buttons i i remember it very distinctly and i thought it would be a much different adventure that would have been over a long time ago and <clears throat> the midst of COVID, I believe, or shortly thereafter, we took a family vacation up to Detroit. And as part of that, we got to go by Roy Moore's place and he was having a sale out in his parking lot. And he had all these incredibly old uniforms that I had never seen in person and got to handle. I'd seen them in books and, and whatnot. But when I actually got to put my hands on them and he was very generous and I was able to look at the back of them and see all these differences in the, in the buttons and whatnot, I thought, well, this would be a really interesting way to have a few small things associated with some pictures that I could carry around and share how scouting history had, had changed. And so I thought, well, there might be, you know, 10 or 12 different buttons that I'll have to collect and I could get them all in, you know, a year or so and how uh, how wrong I was about that 